That's what uh, that's what Cliff did. Cliff, got, because he was going to start doing a couple of streaming things here and there, he got a whole like green screen and light set up and everything. <laughs> He's got you beat. You've been doing this for over a year now, Cassie, and uh, he just started this month. Uh -huh. <laughs> I also don't have a stable location. I've done that's this true. from like five different states. So you got to come up with like your uh, your you're uh on the road kit. you're on yeah. the road streaming <laughs> kit your gorilla streaming kit <laughs> i have some cool shadow run signs but i think they're on a wall in another room so i can't really get them yeah. Yeah. behind me so you'll just deal with what we got <laughs> <laughs> uh, my i i put it uh, i this is a relatively recent change. You can't see it as much of it on the camera that you guys can see, Jason. But uh, on the stream, I'm using a different camera. And, but I used to have my crappy office behind me. So. But did you just nail that blanket to the ceiling? Is that what we got going on here? Yeah. Well, it's not to the ceiling. But yes, it's nailed to the wall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm thinking about getting some of those cool-looking uh sound f foam panels um mm -hmm. mostly because they have really cool texture on them and if i put a light down and like off to the side and shine it diagonally across me against the wall it would create like a nice cool i thought textured effect and if i get one of those hue light bulbs i could change the color <laughs> <laughs> all right Ooh. always thinking It was daytime. I'd turn and give the window view over here because you know at least there's trees and stuff. But it's night, so you just see my reflection, and that doesn't do any good for anyone. <laughs> I was gonna think about getting just those three like paper dividers, you know, you find in like uh, Asian markets. Like, let's do that. Oh yeah, and shine that'd a light cool. on it and. That'd be cool. And uh, have mm -hmm. things pass by it every once in a while. Yep. <laughs> Cardboard cutouts. Do it like uh, like Home Alone style, you know? <laughs> no. <laughs> Close these. Make sure the notes are good. I need to start this. Okay, so it says I'm streaming. That's a good. And it looks like there's people in the chat room, so that's also good. Cassie, can you do a so. real good job? I'm going to try really early in the episode to l get people to think of questions for the after party. Can you do an awesome job of snatching those up and putting them in the show notes? I can do that. And I'll actually do that, not just talk about doing it. I will do it. I think this is the first time I might have actually gotten everything together before, like, successfully. I I'm, shouldn't say that. I'm going to, I'm still going to mess something up. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's un unfortunately become my shtick now. <laughs> what? That I, uh, that I, that I can't get a, uh, an episode right. Um, oh. something always messes up during the episode. Just lean into it. That's what I say. I'll, I'll accept <laughs> it as my shtick. <laughs> well, we've got some people in the chat room. So hello, everybody. I'm glad you're showing up. Um, I, w I think I fixed for those of you who were, who were here in the last episode, I think I fixed to where uh, we're not going to get interrupted in the middle of the show with people's with notifications when people like uh, cheer for us, <laughs> give us bits or, or donations or something like that. But again, as I said last time, um, it's the kind of thing that I don't want to uh, mention during the show because it kind of is not part of the show itself. But um, if anybody who is showing up for the first time and you haven't followed the Twitch channel, um, you should do that. Also, we uh, you could sub you can also subscribe uh, and nope, it's broken. Thanks, Chummer Jim. <laughs> 
<laughs> for letting us know that it's broken again. Here we go. <laughs> Good to get the test early. Yeah, I think he's the one who was testing, who was uh, doing it over and over again last time, <laughs> um, helping us test that out. So, I, I see. It's the strange thing is like they have this whole thing on Streamlabs where you can you can test it, right? Like you can do a a, a test uh, of it, you know. But it um. And I did that, and nothing, it didn't do anything. Like, it didn't make a noise. So. Just enjoy your bits. Yeah, thank you. Like, seriously, thank you. Not just for showing us how to do it, mm -hmm. but uh, or that it's broken. But uh, Weaver 3, you say there's a theater mode button. Are you making a joke about something, or are you telling me something I don't know? That sounds that sounds almost like vaguely like like a feature that I should know about. <laughs> um, let's see. So if we got that, let's let's do a test. Test this. It's it's uh taking its time. Oh, oh, you're talking about uh, like the dark theme for Twitch, yeah. Mhm. Mm Theater mode. Now I'm just looking at cool wall dividers. Some neat scenes could really set the mood. Oh, I bet I know what the problem is. I might have fixed it. Uh, well, I haven't fixed it, but I might be able to fix it. <laughs> I was say, you said that before. Yeah. You fixed it. This time I mean it. I think you're just telling people it's broken to see who will throw bits at you to find out. <laughs> Devious, isn't it? All in a laugh for deploy, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, I don't know. It's probably fixed now, I guess. If you uh, throw us uh, some tips there, then uh, <laughs> then we'll find <laughs> out. Mm, let's see. So we've got these alert profile things. So we need links to those. Uh, widget links. Yeah, so there's the uh, ticker. Thing. Hmm. Event list. There it is. Uh, but it's like the same. But you know, I'm gonna. I may just have to. Um. Again, this probably won't do anything if I turn that off. But I'm gonna try that. <laughs> and you know what? If it happens during the show, then it happens. We'll just try, we'll just try really hard to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> and just you know, and then when the podcast gets released, we'll just be in the middle of talking about something really like really good and thoughtful, and 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 it'll be bling, and you know. You could just ask people people nicely to wait till the end of the show. I believe they did go. last time, right? Yeah, they did. They did. We've got great list, great live listeners here. You guys are awesome. Um, so I'm not really worried about it. Okay, so I think uh, let me do my sound test to make sure. Things are going well. Well, let me make sure I'm recording the audio first. That is probably more important. Mm -hmm. Mm 
All right, I think that's working. Give me one last uh, test, test, test from you guys. Hello, Bobby. How are you doing this evening? Fancy meeting you here. Perfect. <laughs> and I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna do a sound check here. I want you to tell me if this is too loud for you, um, and if you can hear it at all. If it is too loud for you. It's good. It's good. Good. Didn't sound too loud to me. All right. Perfect. All right, I think everything's going well. I'm going to get a couple seconds of silence here so I can uh, cut that out. So silence now. All right. And then... Uh, <laughs> Everything looks to be in order. Let me pull up my notes. And we're going to go live in. In. Um, let's hit this here. Three, two, one. The blacksmith turns into a dragon and eats you. What? Right? Huh? Oh, we're going to do that again. Because I'm going to turn that <laughs> up. <laughs> All right. Pretend that didn't happen. Hey, Eric! Right, right as we're doing the, right as we're about to start. Thanks. That's uh, thanks for the tips. Um, all right. So here we go. And three, two, one. The blacksmith turns into a dragon and eats you. What? Right? Huh? Okay, but if there's any girls there, I want to do them. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Thursday, October 19th. My name's Bobby Frankenberger, and you're listening to episode 28 of the Sixth World Podcast. Our executive producer for today's episode is James O'Neill. Thank you, James, for supporting the show. And as always, I am joined by my... Uh, what, what am I going to say today? My, en my magnanimous co-host... Uh, Cassie Levitt. How's it going, Cassie? Hi, Bobby. It's going good. How you doing? I'm, do I'm doing really well, uh, considering I spent all day at the state fair today. I, I was expecting to be super exhausted. <laughs> but, explains uh, why you're a little red. I am. I even put on some makeup to try to... I'm more red than this. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I put the makeup on anyway because I'm super shiny and greasy, but uh, it didn't cover it all up. But um, today we've got a really special guest that I'm super excited to have on the show with us. Our guest today is the line developer for Shadowrun. You guys have heard of that game before, right? Shadowrun? Well, he's the line developer for it. And uh, please welcome to the show, Jason Hardy. Thank you for coming and joining us, Jason. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, we were excited to have you on. Um, I've wanted to talk to you about... I'm really interested in, in the general... Um, like, like, like thought and, and work that goes into making RPGs. And, um, so I've, all, I've wanted to have some, some, uh, someone to talk to like you on the show for a while and who better, of course, because this is Shadowrun that we talk about here. And I am someone like me. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So who better to have someone like you than, than you in particular? Um, so... Like I said, I went to the fair today. Uh, that was pretty exciting. So there was this weird thing there. Uh, <laughs> they always have these like weird animal exhibits, right? And uh, one of them was they called it like Camels of America or like the Great American Camels or something. It was this like camel show. It's in this place that they always they always have like rides or something. Of animal. We've ridden elephants there, which was kind of sad. But um, <laughs> but anyway, they had camels there. And uh, this guy was like this camel trainer, and he does like camel shows. And you're like, oh, wow, what can camels do? This must be good if it's supposed to be worthy of, uh, of a whole show of camels, right? And so we sat down and watched it. And it was, it was, uh, 
It was really lame. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the guy comes out and he's like, he's a good showman. He comes out and he's like, hey, everybody, I'm so and so and I'm a world renowned camel trainer and, uh, and behaviorist and we love animals here and we're going to show you what some of these camels could do. We're going to get them to line up right now and here we go. They're going in a circle. They're walking in a circle. Everybody give it. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, okay? This is how it went. And then he was, <laughs> it was something along the lines of like, like, oh, okay, so so you saw that, but um, uh, now we're going to get them to line up into two lines, and we're, we're going to get them to walk in a line, and half of the line's going to go this way, and half of the line's going this way. Everybody give them a... <laughs> I'm like, what is going on here? Um, but uh, people applauded. <laughs> maybe it. maybe what it is maybe i don't know enough about camels maybe uh maybe this is actually really super impressive your um, expectations were far too high it perhaps that's what it is i don't know but uh it was fun they had some weird uh they had stuff all over there but do you have you ever been to do you guys have a state fair near you that you go to <laughs> Not since I was a child. <laughs> yeah, there's some... I mean, Illinois has them, but I think most of the time they're more downstate from where I am, so I yeah. haven't been... There's a Scarecrow Festival not too far from us that we go to, so that's got some of the same vibe, but but no camels. A scarecrow Festival? Is it, are they, like, displaying yeah. sta scarecrows, like like fancy-looking ones, or is there something else to it? No, that, that's how it started, yeah, is they just have, uh, it's in a town called St. Charles, and they'd have uh, all sorts of groups, you know, the different scout troops and whatever other community groups want to make scarecrows, and they'd display scarecrows all along their town square, and they'd do different types of scarecrows, whatever they came up with. And so the first time I went, which was like 35 years ago, it was pretty much just the scarecrows in the town square, but then I went again in the past five or ten years and the scarecrows are there but it's like all the fair food right and carnival right. rides and it's a huge thing it's it's gotten pretty impressive but as <laughs> i said no camels fair food is exactly the reason that we go to the state fair every year yeah oh man i've eaten so much food today um and and there's more to come when I get done with the show with you guys. I'm sitting down and eating some elephant ears. Uh, <laughs> we have some that we brought home. Oh man, I love it. Oh, they had pizza on a stick. Um, it's uh, oh, it's Bobby. it's weird. Just say no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I can't say no. Absolutely not. What have you been doing this week, Kara? Since our last episode, Cassie? Much uh, in general, in life, how's life? Uh. Uh, I play Shadowrun. Yeah, and well, I think I do other things, but I can't recall any of them right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work. <laughs> I, I don't really imagine you doing anything other than Shadowrun anyway. So that's true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I can't defend that. I've got nothing that <laughs> maybe what I do here. Oh, you made it sad. Um. <laughs> no, no, no. I did put, all the time yeah. happy, happy. Yes, yes. I did put out some of my home room stuff out there on our Shadowrun, with like the the things I've updated from fourth to fifth. So that stuff's out there. Oh, yeah, cool. I'll, I'll do that. Well, that's cool. <laughs> that's uh, it's always uh, f there's some good stuff from fourth edition. So. Yeah, I updated the entire like augment, make, do your own augmentation stuff, so you can do cyber surgery on yourself. Oh gosh. <laughs> Cyber yeah. surgery on yourself, like. Well, I did the entire like up from augmentations book. I put converted all the stuff to fifth edition for doing cyber surgery. Everything okay. from repairing bio. So you don't literally bio mean bio performing bio surgery on yourself. I guess if you're really good, I would increase yeah. the threshold by one or two more, or maybe give you a negative two distracted. But yeah, let's see why not. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's um let's get on to this today one day one day i'll fix how quiet that is um so news stuff real fast um it's all just like uh self-promotion stuff this this go around uh this um we've got uh, from join the anarchy they they're in the middle of their arc if you ever listen to their show they're in the middle of their arc to end their um their season 
Uh, join the Anarchy, if you don't know, it's um, it's sort of like a wacky improvised Shadowrun Anarchy actual play series. It's told on the fly through our audience participation on Twitch, right here on our Twitch channel, actually, twitch.tv slash Shadowcasters Network. Um, it's, like I said, ramping up towards their big season finale, and they're going to be uh, their their main characters, their uh, recurring characters, Dur uh, Turbo, Retro, and Arsenal. Their story is going to be completely wrapped up on November 27th. Um, you can catch up on previous episodes if you haven't seen stuff via their YouTube page. Just search Join the Anarchy Shadowrun on YouTube. You'll find it. And um, help them go out with a, a bang by tuning in every other Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern here on the Shadowcasters Network Twitch channel. You can see the schedule down there below or just go to shadowcasters.network slash schedule and uh, you can see uh, when they're going. It's every other week. Um, is, uh, other things coming. We, we're doing a, we've been doing a lot of streaming this week and we've got some more to come um, on Saturday because uh, we, we, we've told you guys we've got this. Uh, we're doing Shadowrun Chronicles Lockdown. Me, uh, Damien from the Violent Life Podcast, uh, Mr. Johnson from the Arcology Podcast, and th everyone's favorite Crow Shaman, uh, Opti. All four of us are going to be playing, are, are playing um, all the way through together on the stream, uh, all the way through uh, Shadowrun Chronicles Lockdown. And, uh, and we're starting that officially on Thursday, October 26th, but we just had a character creation session between Mr. Johnson and Opti. They played through, they made their characters on the stream, and they played through the first couple of missions. And uh, me and Damien are going to be doing the same thing on Saturday, doing the same sort of thing. And then, again, like I said, Thursday, October 26th, so a week from today, that as of when we're recording, we're going to be, we're going to start that show, and it's going to be every other week, opposite these episodes when we record so we're really excited about that so and i, I hear there's mm -hmm. some emerald grid news you wanted to throw in here cassie oh yeah uh we our recruitment's closed for october i'm doing that run tomorrow and then we're have already got the post up for november so anybody who's looking to apply and go through that interview process we got games posted for november so yeah go check that out on top of the subreddit we love the emerald grid i can't ever say it enough Jason, do, speaking oh, yeah. of... That's what... Well, one more thing. You are supposedly going to be in a game on Sunday, right? So come watch Bobby play Shadowrun on Sunday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is it going to be streamed? I'll plug the Twitch channel at the end of that. Yeah, hopefully yeah. so. My triumphant <laughs> return to the Emerald Grid playing Funky Town. I've gotten some of the some of the details. What did, what did people say? Some I've got the deets from, uh, from Todd, uh, who's going to be GMing that. Um about I'll what's plug that at the end of the show yeah what's going to be going <laughs> on um i'm excited about it so yeah we'll, we'll talk more about that at the end of the show um but yeah jason do you play much of uh have you played played the uh various shadowrun computer video games that are out there I don't yeah know. most of them yeah yeah so have you played I lockdown played, uh, chronicles yeah yeah i played chronicles we um we're playing it for I, the first I time the through, but i did did a lot Cool, cool. Yeah, we're playing through it for the first time and um, trying to like dig in deep, like reading all the text and and really kind of you know we've got we've got Opti on there with us, the lore aficionado himself. So we we wouldn't be able to get away with not like oh, gotta get it on. You're making Scotch. Let's a very happy man. So we appreciate. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we like Scotch. Scott, he was just on the show. I think and oh, I just. Uh, well, I'm going to mention that later also, so um, I won't ruin the uh, sp spill the entire show right now. Um, let's move on to uh, let's move on to this. Q and A time for uh, we're going to answer some questions. Every at this point in the show, every episode we answer some questions that are sent to us from our fans, from our listeners, and uh, they send them to us usually via the website, sixworldpodcast.com. We've got a form right there where you can ask questions, um, or you can email at the show at sixthworldpodcast.com. Um, if you want your questions to have priority, our patrons on Patreon also, we, we give their questions priority, and they have a better chance of being asked on the show. So we've got two questions. They're actually both from the same person. Um, and, uh, and I wanted, I thought they were good questions, from Ross D'Souza. And he asks, 
When you cast Improved Invisibility on a character, what does this look like in astral space? Uh, from what I understand, they look bright due to the spell being cast. Therefore, is there a way of, of uh, being sneaky in both real world and astral at the same time via spells? This is actually not an uncommon question. I've seen this uh, bandied about, so I bet you Cassie's got an answer already. I don't think people are going to like my answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's false impressions in Manascape. If your group's using shadow spells, they let you do some illusions in the astral that you can be a little tricky with. Uh, some people will allow extended masking to go on spells, e even if they are not cast on the person. I don't interpret it that way, but that's the thing you might try. But in general, the answer is just no. <laughs> spells are not a substitute for the sneaking skill. And I always find improved visibility a weird one because people seem to treat it like it's a win-all for sneaking. But yeah. all it does is make you invisible. You can still be heard, smelled, like all the other forms of perception. So, right, that's, uh, that's kind generally. of always been my thought is uh, specifically about sneaking and invisibility is is um like like there's got to be balance, right? There's got you can't just have like a a win spell. Um. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the thing that's sneaking spells are bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It spells and this weakness of spells is that they're going to show up on the astral. So if you've got astral security, they're not really going to save you there. Um, yeah. The, so so yeah. Um, I think I think um, it's tough to get around the uh, the astral beacon quality of using any kind of a spell. So um, it's tough to yeah. <laughs> that's the weakness of spells. I don't know what to say right. there. That's yeah. the balance, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Rasta Souza also asks, though, uh, with astral signatures, I understand that when you cast uh, a spell, you leave a signature that can be traced unless it's cleaned. So with a fireball, there's a signature that's left in astral space for X number of hours unless it's cleaned. What happens when the target of a spell can move, e.g. invisibility again? Does the signature follow or stay where the spell was originally cast, or does something else happen? Yeah, this is a good one. Uh, it comes up quite frequently, too. Uh, so I've got a quote here from Core. It's on page 312. It says, An astral signature of a spell can be detected both where it was cast and where it took effect. Uh, so most people, like if you uh, interpret that the way I do, will say that it takes effect on, say, your lodge, if that's where you cast it while you're at home. And then if you leave your lodge, it's going to continue to be tied on you as you walk around, right? So if you cast a physical mask on the face, it's going to be wherever you cast it, as well as wherever the face is moving around, it's still on him until the spell dissipates. So. Does, that, does that mean you're leaving, like, a like an astral, like, slug trail? Like, snail no, trail? Well, I mean, sort of, because astral signatures can be tracked, but really right. I think it's more of just, like, it's a fingerprint, right? So it's a fingerprint on sure. wherever you cast the spell, and then also on whatever you cast, whether it's uh, the fireball being 20 meters away because that's where you have line of sight and that's sure. where it ended up or the person that you cast it on. If it's a here's, person. here's a good question and maybe Jason you can answer answer this for me. I've always wondered this. Um, so astral signatures are talked about as a thing as they've been around forever. Uh, are they like, is an astral signature just something that can be, that is is like this hazy signature that's floating around that anybody in astral space would would maybe notice or is it deliberately like something like a fingerprint you would have to go with your astral fingerprint dust and go searching for it to <laughs> to find it well you'd have to be able to see it um so you have to have some sort of way of perceiving the astral but as sure. long as you can you don't have to uh search it out like you would a fingerprint it would be uh, more like a big glass door with lots of fingerprint smudges all over it. Sure, or you're okay. gonna see it. So it's it's the kind of thing oh. that that if you're you know perceiving the astral and and a spell a big four six spell was recently cast there, you might be like, oh wait, something what happened here, and even though you weren't right. looking for it. But that's the real trick is knowing what that something is because sure. there's going to be a lot of things that have some presence in the astral. So knowing what the thing is and what useful information you can get from seeing the signature is going to be what really matters. Right, right. Well, that's that's cool. I've always wondered that. So um, that answers my question. Uh, see, I don't have to write in. Um, 
but uh, <laughs> I hope that I hope that helped Ross uh, with your questions. So um, yeah, I want to go ahead and jump right into this. So we have now uh, moved on to the main topic portion of the show. The reason that we have Jason Hardy here hanging out with us and talking to us, we wanted to talk about RPG development and you know Shadowrun in particular because. As I've said, uh, Jason is the line developer for Shadowrun, so um, the perfect person to talk to about these types of things. Um, what I want to tell the chat here is that, of course, after every episode, we always have a uh, sort of like after party, right? After the episode, we hang out for just a little bit and, and chit chat and often uh, ask questions of our guests that we didn't get to ask during the show. So if you guys who are here live have questions, um, either save them for the end of the show, ask them, or uh, jot them down in the chat. Cassie's going to do her best to pull those out so that we we answer them. So as you're thinking about things. And can you guys hear the fireworks? No. No? Okay. No, nope, not coming through. That's good. That's good. <laughs> because uh, I'll take a moment to say happy Diwali to any of our Hindu listeners. Uh, because uh, we have some Hindu neighbors across the street. And um, they warned us. But I'm not going to like move the... But they said they're shooting off fireworks. They're celebrating. So... Um, I'm glad you guys can I'm glad that's not uh, coming through on the thing but uh, so yeah um, I guess the the easy way to kind of like softball into this topic Jason is to do the ask the question that you're always gonna get when you're coming on to a show like this in the position that you're in and for this reason which is tell us because a lot of people probably don't know I mean I don't know all about it what what does it mean you're the Shadowrun line developer what does that mean what do you do that's what I've spent the past eight years trying to figure out. <laughs> right. um, I've learned a little bit. Uh, basically, if, if anything comes out for Shadowrun, I have to do all the shepherding through its various steps of existence to make sure it comes out. So that means coming up with ideas for books and getting a description of them that's approved by our management, uh, hiring writers to write the stuff, uh, drawing up art notes so that our art director can hire artists to make the art. Um, then reviewing all the stuff that comes in to make sure it's what I want it to be. Uh, mm. Getting it edited, getting it proofed, uh, getting it all formatted for layout so layout guy can do things. And then just making sure every step of the way happens and then it goes to press and comes out. So if, if I don't do any of the steps then they tend not to happen. The writers right. are very good about doing their writing thing, but sure. you know, it's not going to come together unless I do stuff. So, so I have to make it happen. So <laughs> do you like how hands-on, how hands-on in the process are you? Like, are you make are you making calls about like, I don't like, you know, this meta plot element. Let's change that to something else. Are you making those, are you coming up with those ideas on your own and giving them to writers? Like, how does that work? Um, well, I like the writers to, to be able to contribute things. So I, I'm trying not to have, you know, an iron hand where I tell the writers, sure. you know, here are my ideas and my ideas will go through. So the writers often contribute uh, their plot ideas. And as they're fleshing out a chapter, because usually when a book gets described, you'll get maybe a paragraph describing what a chapter is going to be. Um, and so they're doing a lot of fleshing out. And so they're right. contributing a lot that way. Um, but, you know, I, I am reviewing, and if there are things that uh, are going in a direction I like, I want to encourage it. If there's things that seem like there might be a problem to me, then I'll steer it in another direction. I, I'm hands-on enough to at least read everything and try to make sure that things are going in a way I think will be fun. Right, right. But hands-off enough so that people can contribute their ideas and, and make things happen. That's, I mean, that sounds like... You know, like your writers are are the ones that are that are bringing everything to life, right? So you want to kind of, I guess, harness that creativity that they have, um, and right. I'm I'm not smart enough to you know, <laughs> come up with everything that happens in Shadowrun on my own. And sure. Shadowrun is such a big universe; it would be no good for everything to be the way I do it. And they are such a creative talented bunch working for it. They need to have their room to do cool stuff. How much? How much? How many times? How often? Uh, does everybody come up with all these ideas and they're just incompatible and you have to and it has to be mediated <laughs> um 
it, it has happened some in the past. We, but that's one of the things I'm, I tried to learn about how to do this better is keep communication going uh, as projects move forward. So mm -hmm. we do have, you know, we use Basecamp. So right, writers right. know who's working on other sections. They know what those other sections are. So if they think a plot element might affect someone else's plot element, then they can communicate and talk to each other and coordinate that way. And that helps a lot. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess that makes perfect sense. I don't, you know, you, people communicate with each other. They're all working on the same things. Do you have, um, <laughs> from what I understand, I know that from, just from talking to, we talk to a lot of the freelance writers here on the show. Uh, I know that there's like a, a, a pitch process, you know, like every, you, it's like, okay, we're going to be doing a book about this. Give me your ideas. Is that kind of just generally how it works? Yeah. Well, we, once a year at Gen Con, we have a freelancer meeting and I, I need to have more of freelancer meetings just because it's good to get their input, but at least once a year. And that's a good chance for them to just throw out ideas in general for books they might want to see for things they think would be cool. Uh, at the last Gen Con, we had some plot ideas come out of there that the freelancers contributed that I think uh, are going to shape some pretty significant events in the next few years. And it wasn't something where my mind was really going, but they presented a compelling case. And once I started to see what kind of missions could come out of the plots they were suggesting, it could be very cool. So that, that will help shape right. things. Um, but then for individual books, once I have a schedule and I know what titles are going to come up, um, then I'm usually outlining the chapters and then they're fleshing out what's going to go in the chapter. So they'll give me a proposal saying, I want to do this chapter. Here's the sort of stuff I would put into it. And uh, once I approve a chapter, I'll say, yeah, most of that stuff is good. Maybe change this a little bit, or I'll just say everything you said was awesome. Go with it. Sure. I won't say, you know, you get to write the chapter, but everything you proposed was terrible because if that was the case, they wouldn't have gotten the chapter. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, so, I get like, so, um, how am I going to phrase this question? So, when I read through a lot of the 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 crunch, uh, the rules, and and then you know the the Lord uh, that accompanies all that, and um, I I always think like like oh this seems like so realistic, and the rules are like really really dense, and it seems like they're spent a lot of time. Shadowrun is well known for being a crunchy system, right? So a lot of there are definitely rule systems where it seems like a lot of attention and effort has been paid to make this thing that exists in the real world seem as real as possible. But there are other parts of the game that that it seems like you you know you want to you want to like realism is kind of kind of set aside to to make something more playable or fun or and whatnot and how right. how is that how do you maintain that balance like it seems so difficult to me like how you would you would decide like I, I think I put like in the notes here like the matrix is obviously something that it seems like you want to you, over the years it's been made an effort has been made to make it fun and playable at the expense of plausibility or realism maybe not plausibility but you know what I mean um, whereas the right. like melee combat, like with uh, martial arts and everything, like it seems like such a detailed system at an, uh, trying to make it seem realistic. And I wonder. You mean whenever you're deep sea diving and come up too fast, a kraken doesn't really just grab you? Well, that's what happened to me. Um, <laughs> so that seems really realistic to me. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, how do you ma how do you how do you deal with that balance? A lot of that comes through uh, feedback in various forms of playing. So it, both play testing when you're putting the rules together, but especially when you're doing a new edition, um, anytime you're doing a new edition, like we were doing when we did fifth, mm -hmm. um, you have years of play testing of the previous edition where people have just been playing it and you, you get your own impressions of what's working and you hear from other players about what's working and what isn't working. And you try to make adjustments based on that. Uh, fourth edition made tremendous strides toward getting the Matrix more involved with the rest of Shadowrunning. Um, but as I was playing fourth edition, there were times where I saw that deckers or hackers for fourth could still be more removed from the action. They could still keep a distance and they, it was still a little bit separate. 
So when we went into fifth edition, we very much wanted to uh, make it more integrated with the rest of the action so that a lot of hacking could happen while other things are going on. Right. And we did not want uh, Deckers in a box as much as possible. We sure. wanted Deckers out and doing things. And so that informed a lot of the system design for, for fifth edition is if it's going to go alongside of everything else, it has to be fast and it has to be streamlined. Um, so extended tests, we didn't want too many of those because that just drags it out. We wanted it to be quick and punchy. Sure. Um, so that's why that happened. So it could work along with combat. And then, you know, we are trying to sell books. Right. So we are um, subject to user feedback. And when we keep seeing books with combat options and things that uh, are really interested, interesting to the player base, and they keep liking combat options, then we will also often give combat options because if people like it, I'm happy to give it to them. Sure, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that makes perfect sense. And a lot of times I think the reason that that has a disconnect with me is because, or, or I find it difficult to wrap my head around these complex like combat systems, for example, is that that's just something that I don't dive into. Like, I'm not, you know, the one out there digging into each martial art and trying to find out what technique I can learn from this one and combine with this to do whatever, you know. It's just not something that gets me. I mean, that's an interesting thing about Shadowrun in general, right? It, it, it's got so many different ways to play it in this, yeah. you know, that... that I wonder sometimes, and maybe do you think about this? I wonder sometimes, is that, is that uh, all the different ways and all the different amounts of rules that there are and all the different choices and options that everybody have, is it? do you ever con get concerned that it's weighing things down like w with just the number of options that you have? Like, I know it sounds great, we as red-blooded Americans who love our freedom, um, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great to have like more choice. But I, I sometimes, like, I wonder if more choice isn't the is is the wrong solution. You know, like, do you do you think about that? Do you right. worry about that? Yeah, I do worry about that. Um, and, and sometimes what you see with Shadowrun is that accumulated weight of the years, where you know combat systems um, pull in things from previous editions because they existed before, mm -hmm, so they're mm -hmm. going to exist again. Um, and that's why, you know, in the core book now, you have things like adepts and technomancers and a lot of options that didn't exist in earlier edition sure. core books because those were things that uh, weren't there when the game started, but they became integral to the game. So they become more of an option. Um, I think one of the great opportunities with Anarchy was because we were really trying to do something different. And it didn't. It didn't have to lean on previous editions yeah. rule-wise in any way at all. It could be its own thing, and so we were free to to make things as simple as we want. We could make combat much more streamlined, and that was a good experiment at just you know shedding a lot of previous edition stuff and seeing what worked just for that edition. Um, and, and I like the way it turned out. So that was fun to play with. Right. Oh, I th we have we've had a blast with Anarchy. I know Cassie's played it a good bit. She has a she's on an actual play that does anarchy. You you like anarchy, right, Cassie? Oh yeah. No, I still am working on making a character sheet for it for Roll Twenty and we I think Oz and I were talking about homebrewy stuff that he's been doing. Yeah. For uh Join the Anarchy and other such things. So. Speaking of Oz, yeah. Ozcore of Join the Anarchy we were just talking about, he would kill me if I didn't at least bring this up. He has he he's always talking about and thinking about this and he wants he's he's always asking where, where is, where is like anarchy going to be? Where is it, is it going to land in the space of future Shadowrun development? Is it going to be like, uh, you know, more anarchy product released? Is is are you guys thinking about the reception of anarchy and thinking about working that into the future Shadowrun core, like, or maybe a both? I don't know. Yeah, we. Uh, I mean, the, the idea with Anarchy was to put it out and then see what the response was um, to see if we wanted to do more. But it was pretty quick after the release that our president was coming to me and saying, we're going to do more Anarchy because the reception was good. <laughs> oh, uh, well, so that, there will I be know more a lot anarchy. of people are going to hear that and rejoice. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, the, the joke in Catalyst this year 
I mean, we're not a large company. We are yeah. very full-time employees. And the joke in the company this year has been whenever any question is asked about product lines or delays or things not working as quickly as we might like, it's because Dragonfire. Sure. Dragonfire, Dragonfire, Dragonfire. We, we had this version of Shadowrun Crossfire that came out that uses a Dungeons & Dragons skin uh, called Dragonfire. And... It was a very ambitious launch strategy that we went on that uh, where the, the game core game was going to come out at the same time as two expansions. And then they have like five expansions planned and more beyond that. Sure. So the amount of company resources that's sucking up in terms of time, especially our art director, is just getting slammed. Uh, so things get delayed because Dragonfire takes up so much time. Everyone else's time, not mine. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. I was so just out of curiosity, um, like, uh, not that you need to know the exact number, like, how big is Catalyst? Like, less than 100 people? Less than 50? Just... <laughs> Way less than 100 people. Yeah, yeah well <laughs> under 50. I mean, full, full-time full staff, yeah. You, yeah, just a handful. Yeah. Okay. We, we have, let's see, most of the company meets when we have our weekly Shadowrun production meeting, and I forget how many of them are full-time, four, five, six at most full-time people. Wow. Then we have some part-time people. Then we have our army of freelancers, which, you know, so once you take in the freelancers, then we're probably getting over 100. Sure. Uh, but as far as core full-time staff, we're actually kind of small. I always laugh because I think some people lose that perspective is where they just imagine it's like people in an office, like, hammering out stuff. And I'm like, I don't think they're probably more than 20. <laughs> it's like right. the core group, right? Like... Yeah. <laughs> well, I always enjoy when I see remarks or emails sent to the Shadowrun development team, and it's like, you know, Here's the team. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right there. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know. It's, it, I hire I, some people to do some ebook development, but there, there's not, you know, I don't have a large staff to, to rely on. I'd love it, but I don't have it. Right. Yeah, I, I think a lot of but people anyway, think. The whole dragon fire. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think a lot of people think Shadowrun is such a, it has been for such a long time, um, such a popular game, and it's it's in the, you know, public consciousness when you think of cyberpunk tabletop role-playing games and and whatnot people think of shadowrun and I, I think that skews people's perception so yeah and it's i mean it, do, it does great it is one of you know whenever the icv2 list of top role-playing games come out it tends to be in the top five but the right. secret is that role-playing games is not a huge market so we, sure. you know the numbers are, are are good to sustain us but they're not huge where I get to have a, a full staff to boss around. Right, right. Uh, but anyway, the whole reason I went off on the Dragonfire spiel oh, right, was right. to say that we do have a follow-up to Anarchy that is being worked on right now uh, by our dedicated Anarchy core team of writers. Um, so they're working on it. What we're going to do is take the Chicago series of missions and adapt it into Anarchy. So you'll get the plot wow. lines get the characters and all that put into anarchy style. So they are hard at work on that right now. I can't give any specific dates because I get beaten if I promise <laughs> dates. Uh, but look for it in early-ish 2018. We'll say that. Cool. That's exciting. I, I know. I'm excited about that. So you, given that you said that, um, how much – this is a interesting thing. So – is there going to be new? Is it always going to be adaptations that get into, like you said, with the Chicago missions, or is there going to be new story and new lore, like like content, you know, new canon lore content that comes from Anarchy? Because I know that some people would be excited about that, but others might feel like, well, to keep up with it, now I'm going to have to, you know, also worry about this you know, line of Shadowrun that maybe I'm not interested in, you know, I don't know. Is, is there, is there right. some sort of demarcation there that you're, or anything? Yeah, well, that that's the trick, is I don't want people who don't play uh, Shadowrun 5 and only play Anarchy feeling like they have to buy books that they're not going to use to keep up with the world, and I don't want people who don't play Anarchy feeling like they have to buy Anarchy books just to keep up with plot developments. Sure. Um, so I think one way to deal with that is what we did with Complete Trog, um, which has a lot of setting material that's useful for both 
fifth edition and anarchy players. So when we statted up a lot of the characters in that, we statted them for both uh, fifth edition and anarchy. So right. I think we can do some products that are dual statted that way that would appeal to both players. Um, but I think for when when plot books come out for anarchy, in some way they're also going to have to come out for Shadowrun Five. So it could be that it's a contemporaneous release that we do a big plot book for Anarchy and then some of the similar plot materials are in SR5 or it could be that Anarchy and some books will lead the way and then you'll see that stuff come out for SR5 um, that, that's up in the air for discussion but I, I don't want to make people buy a rules heavy book for one line that they're not playing yeah yeah I mean that's and that's exactly uh, what I think a lot of people would fear uh, hearing what you said about Anarchy so, so that's good now we talk about uh, lore in Shadowrun and 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 Shadowrun lore lovers are like they love it, um, and so you hear a lot in the community about like more lore books, and we've we know um, we know the answer to that, and it has a lot to do with uh, with you know rules. Are, it has a lot to do with book sales, right? Like rules and crunch uh, is that's what people it seems from the dollars they spend uh that's what they most people want <laughs> um so a lot yeah. of work and energy goes into making a lore book but it doesn't you know you don't get any return on that so i've wondered i've wondered given that and I, this isn't like a, a hidden answer to, or, to anything it's just it's made me wonder do you think that instead of taking like these these crunch heavy books and injecting uh lore in in between in the tidbits you know like and and just intermingling it all do you think that shadowrun could be better served if if the fluff and the crunch were separated completely um i mean you'd never want to separate them completely no i i think the level of separation is an ongoing question that i'll i'll be figuring out what the right balance is sure but i think every book with substantial rules still should have um the universe flavor in there right, and right. some storylines to go along with it just because you know that's the strength of Shadowrun. that's what's carried it over the decades when enough, sometimes yeah. the rules weren't always um comprehensible so the the setting carries it and I'd, I'd never want to turn away from it entirely so there will be some figuring out that right balance um that that's an ongoing question that i, I keep evaluating and keep looking at uh how different books do and we try different things and you know if i hit on a combination that really seems to work then that's what i'll be going with do you have any do you know offhand a, a example of a book that you you feel like did hit the mark pretty close um, well, I think something like Howling Shadows is nice in that it, you have a lot of rules for critters in there, but each write-up of a critter gives a chance to develop some plot and some background uh, without seeming like it's over much. So I think that has a pretty good balance. Um, you yeah, know, it's, it's a tough question because I'm not... I, I like the Deep Shadows books a lot because I sure. like how they incorporate types of runs with plots, with gear. Um, but I'm not sure if they're resonating with the player base as much as I'd like them to. The Helling Shadows book was probably one of my favorites because it actually gave me plot hooks for each of like the critters to use. Versus I know a lot of people compare it to Running Wild, which was nice, but it, Running Wild's a lot more just stat blocks. Which is it's good to have sometimes, but I, I appreciate Howling Shadows uh, integrating a little bit more of the lore and fluff with it. Well, I've, I've seen that in some of our writers who write up the critters, that they're, that's, they're just really good at that, at putting in the plot hooks. So when you read, and this this happened even back in 4th edition with the, the parazoology books, with all those write-ups, mm -hmm. you could just read a character or read about a critter and say, I want to do a run with that critter. I want to see how that critter interferes with runners sure and that's i think a really good reaction to have when looking through those books if a gm says i gotta see this in a game then that's a good thing yeah yeah i think so too um i think that the i think that i guess w one of the thoughts that i had about you know separating not that i again not that i think this is that is the solution separating them it just made me wonder you know like is that 
something to toy around with. But I think the reason that I think about that sometimes is is I want to be well versed in the lore, but every time I try to dig in, it's I give up. <laughs> and um and and uh and I know I'm not alone. I, I mean, you've got people like uh, we talked about earlier we've got people like opti doing the neo-anarchist podcast and he's he has he's like a public servant in the shadowrun community because of that <laughs> and and uh and not that he's complaining you know it gives him something <laughs> he's able to do that like and uh but uh but i wonder like is the lore too dense you know it's been going on since that's again one of the I, I sometimes talk about it like a strength and a weakness in a way of Shadowrun is is that it is a continuous setting, you know, like it's it's not broken up. It's it's got this long storied history, but ha has that made it too dense? Have, has anybody ever talked about rebooting everything and starting so that it's just starting fresh? Yeah, that that's been discussed, and we did kind of play with that a little bit back when we did Shadowrun 2050. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, I remember that. That was a, a chance to give people, you know, to, to play with rules, the fourth edition rules at the time that were um, really good rules, but put them in the 2050 setting that a lot of people liked because that was where they first played. Um, and so that's, there is appeal to that. Um, I think part of the trick, if you're talking about a reboot, you know, the, the concept might sound appealing. Cause like you said, there's a lot of baggage. Um, but then when you try to pick out how you're going to do that and what you're going to lose, sure. that's when at least I get, I, I hit a wall um, because there's so much stuff I don't want to lose. And there's so much stuff that's valuable. I think rather than losing things, uh, we're probably better served figuring out um, how to present what we have and figuring out how to um, make it accessible to people and, and so they feel that they can get in without having to know a lot of things. And I'm, I'm just scanning through a PDF right now because there's one example mm -hmm. I wanted to point out um, in Forbidden Arcana, but I'm trying to remember what chapter it was if it was the wild spirits i think it was the wild spirits um but towards the yeah towards the end of that chapter um there's an extensive shadow talk portion of that chapter mm -hmm. uh, where you see that different characters are dabbling in things that they probably shouldn't and that are very dangerous. And there's a lot of call outs in that chapter to some pretty deep Shadowrun lore. But if you don't know that lore, that chapter is tremendously intriguing anyway. It's written really well. You can tell that there's bad stuff happening. Yeah. <clears throat> happening. And you can see that, you know, this is something my characters will need to know more about because clearly there's dangerous stuff there. And so we need to learn a little more. So even if you don't get all the call outs, uh, the immediacy of the plot is interesting enough that you want to jump in and do that. So I think that, and, and this is a hard thing to do, but I think that's the way to do it is to write about the lore in a way that rather than hit people over the head with just here's 25 years worth of plot baggage, uh, find the hooks that are relevant to them right now and show them how they can get involved in an adventure right away. And then as they get in there, then they might discover more lore, then they might get deeper into it, but find a way to get them in and interested without having to know all that. Sure. Without getting rid of it. Yeah. And you said you, you use it. I know the, the part of that book that you're talking about, and I think that is a good example, but there are, I think you have to be careful, right? Like there are other examples. I can't think of any off the top of my head. I'm really bad about that, but I know I've run across other examples where I've been like, Clearly, they're referring to something here, but I have no idea what they're talking about, and and it can be frustrating. So, um, yeah, I, 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 you have to like, you have to give that little, you have to, you know, hang that uh, that lure, that bait, and everything, and get people hooked, but give them enough that they feel satisfied, you know. <laughs> right. And, 
Yeah, yeah. and that's something to keep to keep working on. But I think that's the avenue to take. Yeah, we certainly haven't always given those hooks so people get in. And sometimes some, there are things that seem impenetrable if you don't know the background. And that's something to keep working on doing better. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, my intention isn't to, you know, tell you you're doing a bad job. Um, <laughs> I no, was no, just... I, the, uh, you just made me think of that. You know? admit there's always things we can do better. It's, it's sure. fine. That's there's no perfect books. It's cool that we keep trying to make them better. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the, uh, um, you mentioned, uh, oh, never mind. I was, I, I elaborated on that. Um, so, so we talked about that, uh, I, 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 something left my brain. I've got to think. Cassie, do you have any questions? <laughs> well, I think you're placing like, their notes. <laughs> well, no, it's a, a different. Um, I had jotted down a piece of paper and I can't. So I'm looking for uh, what it was inspiring me to say that. But um, so we talked about um, balancing uh, realism and and uh, and believability and everything. And and you you. You uh, you made a note in the notes here that I I wanted to make sure I explored because I think it might be a good jumping off point to talk a little bit more about the 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 gr the dirty work of of you know developing Shadowrun which is you in the notes I put you know you know balancing realism with fun and playability and everything and and you made it a little note that said. Uh, <laughs> How do we and how and how do you decide? How do you know what's going to be fun? How do you know what's going to be fun while you're working on it? <laughs> yeah, I put that as a question because that's a question I keep asking myself, not because I have a clear answer. <laughs> because that's uh, that that that's really the question, though. When you're looking at the balance between detail and abstracting it, is it going to be fun in playing? And and so that's when playtesting comes out. And this was something uh, that came out the very first freelancer meeting uh, that I went to when I was hired at Shadow Online Developer. So I was hired at Gen Con in um, 2009. Mm -hmm. And so then they, they introduced me to the freelancers and I got to hang out as they discussed a whole bunch of things. But one of the things one of the freelancers said at that meeting that's just the guiding principle for everything, for any plot development, for any rule we want to throw in, for any way we want to change the sixth world is what kind of opportunities does it give for players? What makes this interesting for players? So, you know, if I get caught up in, you know, the, the political situation in uh, between the UCAS and the CAS or between the CAS and Aslan, and I want to talk about how their high level power brokers are fighting about each other and doing all this maneuvering, does that do anything for players? Not immediately. Right. So the first thing I need to figure out is if I'm going to make this plot happen, what is it going to change for players on the ground so that they they have something that they're going to want to do? Um, and that's the same with any rule. If, if a rule is introduced, does it give players an opportunity to do something cool or is it just making their life more difficult with more accounting and bookkeeping? Right. So you want to try to make it cool. Definitions of cool vary from person to person, <laughs> so it's yeah, impossible and that's, to. I mean, I can't everyone, imagine but, how much how difficult that is, you know. <laughs> yeah, so you know, you do. You, that's that's where the playtesting comes in. Um, when we did Shadowrun Five, I remember when I got all the playtesting comments in, and I was looking at sheaves and sheaves of Word documents, and so I went to management and said, "Can I hire someone? Just can I have a, a little budget so I can." give someone money to organize this so I don't have to because <laughs> it was mm -hmm. a lot. And so they let me. And so a, a very kind and dedicated freelancer took it on and I ended up with like a hundred page document. And he said, you know, and I took out the things that either were repetitive or that were unhelpful, like things that said, this is stupid. They sure. That out. <laughs> it had to be more specific about why it was stupid. Right. <laughs> um, but that meant I had a you know, hundred pages of playtesting data to look at about what was working and what wasn't. Um, and when we were doing playtesting for Shadowrun 5, we had a completely different initiative system when we started it. Uh, it was kind of uh, a point system, a lot like you see in a, an action point system, like you might see in a board game. Yeah. You get a certain amount of action points and you try to spend them. Um, and, and that gave us some cool mechanical possibilities. And I like the concept behind it. And every time we played with that system, it was death. It just slowed combat down 
more and the last thing Shadowrun combat needs is to be slower. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And people <laughs> trying to remember how much they spent and do the calculations. And so we just had to face up to the fact that, you know, while it had cool mechanical possibilities in that, it wasn't working. And it was slowing the game down and it was making it less fun, more bookkeeping. So we had to scrap it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the things that I find really really interesting and in and, and difficult to think about is is those types of tough decisions. You know, like like I spent so much time thinking about like okay, you've got a D6 system in this and you've got a D10 or a D20, you know, like like what are the implications of each and uh and what you know, what are the the differences and strengths and weaknesses of just of something as simple as what how many sides are on your dice? Um, <laughs> because that's it, where your math guys come in handy and right people with cool dice probability spreadsheets right i love those right <laughs> it's uh it's it's hard um so you do you know any are there any other examples of um of rules like like things that you've worked on in the rules while you're working on you know like i don't know like fifth edition or just like a new crunchy book that you've gotten like really far in the process and thought this is, and then, and then suddenly had to face the realization that this isn't going to work and you had to scrap it. Um, I, there, there were probably some I should have scrapped, but we'll, we'll not go over. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, there, I, I try to read books, you know, looking and I can't remember off the top of my head, but there have been a number of times reading a rule where just, you know, as I'm reading the rule, the alarm bells go off in my head and just reading it, I can I can feel how it's going to be abused in play. So it has to be changed quick. Um, but in the end, if you get the core system in place, um, most everything else at least gets easier. So that when you're doing like uh, a spell book, the, the spells are going to relate to the core system. Sure. So those tweaks, if you have to make a change late there, uh, it's not as difficult because you're not changing the main system. You already did that. Uh, so you're just tweaking how you made adjustments to it. And that, that you can make adjustments to pretty late in the process, and it's not too critical. So that happens all the time. Even, even in the proofing stages, the proofers will point out something that looks a little bit out of balance, and so we can tweak numbers, and that goes right up to print time. But I can't think of specific examples just because it happens every book that something gets tweaked. Sure, sure. Has anybody has anybody uh, ever suggested that um, that it move away from a D six system? And were they did they make it out of the building alive after that? <laughs> <laughs> um, not seriously suggested it, and so uh, we didn't have to kill them because they weren't serious. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, there, there's lots of other D systems, but D6, first of all, is shadow run. Right, right, right. Uh, but it, it also, a dice pool system really gives you good probability curves. But just to tell you how dedicated people are to, to shadow run D6s, we didn't have arguments about whether to use D6s or not. That was assumed. The argument we had for fifth edition was when you're listing how many six sided dice, is it a capital D? or a lowercase d. <laughs> That's what we argue about. I love it. I prefer a lowercase d just because I think it looks slimmer and more elegant, but I was surprised at how passionate <laughs> some of the freelancers were about having that capital D because that's what felt like Shadowrun to them. So I was like, "Wow, all right, you want the capital D, I'll give you a capital D. And then they were happy, and if capitalizing the letter can make people happy, <laughs> then I'm down for it. So you, uh, you mentioned like uh, one of the problems with Shadowrun currently the fifth edition is kind of how bloated it's gotten just with the, so many previous editions for the next edition. Is there any kind of thoughts of reducing stuff down? Obviously, Anarchy did fairly well with a few less things. Not that you want to go yeah, totally that route. <laughs> I mean, there's there's nothing concrete, um, but when, whenever a next edition comes, it certainly can't get bigger. Right. Um, so I mean, it could. Let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> it would be unwise. Oh, yeah. Um, so, and and I think one of the main things Fifth Edition did 
was, you know, it took fourth edition, which had made a lot of considerable changes and kind of built on fourth edition. So fifth edition has a lot of the fourth edition core elements, but refined them or tweaked them in different ways. Um, and you can't really do that again. So whenever the time comes for sixth edition, we can't retweak that same core system. We have to find new things to do. And so if we're going to do new things, that means we're not quite as tied to the old systems. So sure. we could, you know, f figure out different ways to slim it down and figure out just how different we want to be while still maintaining the core uh, of rolling a, a fair amount of D6s because that's how you know you're playing Shadowrun. Right. Right. I mean, you you kind of have to lean into that that meme that's been around forever about having to bring your bucket of dice, right? Like, like yeah. that's... That's part I'm good of... with the buck of the dice. I just yeah. don't need 80-something active skills. <laughs> well, I think once you break well, down all enough. the exotic no, weapons. Cassie, stuff. you know that. I'm I'm yeah. never going to argue that I think things should be slimmed down. But um, So I'm not going to... I'm not going to ask you to tell us when a sixth edition is coming because even I'm sure even if you <laughs> did know you you wouldn't you would not be inclined to tell us. But uh, the uh, what I I would advise against it even. <laughs> Don't, <make that laughs> <Right. promise. laughs> Don't even start that rumor. <laughs> um, but what I do want to ask is is do I'm always curious about when, what 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 motivates or inspires a decision to come out with. A, a fifth edition, just another the next edition. Do you do you th look at the number of books that are out and say, look, looks like there's too many books, let's start over, <laughs> or or is it? Do you say like, oh, I, or do you wait until like like there really is like a a, a bug list long enough, so to speak? You know, like oh, we need to fix some things. Things could be better, and once that list gets long enough, is that when you, like what what makes that decision? Um, yeah, there's a number of things that would go into it. Some of it is, yeah, how, how much do you have for the current edition and what more can you release um, that's still intriguing? So I think we have a number of books that we can still do for fifth edition that address some interesting areas. So sure. that, that gives us more time in that edition. When you run out of books, um, you know, then you have to look at, is it time to do a new edition? Because... Uh, or, or I just have to do a new job for a while because if sure. I can't do any really intriguing books for Shadowrun, then I have to do something else, and we'll let Shadowrun lie for a while, and then pick up a new edition. Right, because that brings up the question day. to me of of if you've gotten to that point where it's like there's nothing, you know, we're not gonna, we think it's a bad idea to release, you know, the fifth combat uh, guns book, you know, like or <laughs> you know, <laughs> you you just say like, look, we've done enough, but but do you decide like? Well, let's come up with another edition. Let's look for something to change. I, you don't want to do that, do you? Like, no. I mean, and, and one of the other things that has to happen before a new edition has to come out is is I can't be burned out from making a new edition anymore. Sure, sure. <laughs> that, the burnout from making fifth edition lasted a long time. Yeah, and I, I was not all that into thinking of new rules. So that that at least you know, the the whole crew has to be ready. So you mentioned a bug list, and and like I said. Um, if a sixth edition, whenever that comes along, it won't be just about fixing bugs in fifth edition. It'll be, you know, you're going to have to go in a little bit more reinventing the edition somehow. Uh, and I don't know what that would look like. Right. Um, so it, it's not just fixing bugs, but, you know, do we have enough interesting concepts of ways to play a role playing game? that would be interesting, that would maybe be faster, but would still feel like Shadowrun. Yeah. Um, so we have to have enough of those concepts to do it. If, if no one's feeling enough energy to do that or the motivation and we don't think we have the ideas, then it's going to be tough to bring out a new edition. Yeah, do you, do you come up with a, a big world-changing event that, that spawns the next edition? Is that something that's always like thought about, or, or is that...? Yeah, that's always something that's at least discussed, because some of that is what, you want, what changes you want to make to the world. Sure. Um, you know, in, in the leap from third to fourth, they wanted to have a big matrix crash because they needed to reinvent the matrix to move it to the wireless matrix and make that happen really fast. Right. That's so something that I've was, always that's something I've I've said before on the show that I've always thought was cool and interesting about um this property of Shadowrun is is because it's a living world, you know, you want to make a big rules change 
you have to like in the story in the in the in the plot the story of the game you you almost have to justify it i mean obviously that is the the take that that you guys have is that you do have to justify it so yeah you want to make the world flow Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're going to do a big world change now, so that depends on what the rules look like. If you feel you need to do something, um, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of the time jump. I mean, I can see why it's needed sometimes. Um, but I think, especially when the lore is as deep as shadow runs and, and people often have to spend time catching up with what existed before mm -hmm. if you do a time jump and then you also have to fill in what happened in those years then that just seems like a mountain of information that has to get filled in in different ways and that's so do you mean a by a time jump do you mean like saying oh the next edition is gonna you know 20 years later that sort of thing right okay right that's i 20 years especially would be such a big amount of time yeah, yeah. that that would be a real challenge I don't even want to think about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, so before we end up wrapping up the main portion of the show, I did want to ask, um, there's an, 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 a question that I thought about that is, um, that is just in general, what your take would be on this. Um, we like everybody has a sort of like different take on the gaming industry and what it is and things that should be different and things that they like and don't like and, and ways that they would do it better and stuff like that. And um, I'm sure that being, being, you know, someone who works in the industry, you have a different, um, maybe better take on a lot of those things. Are there any things about, so this is more of a general yeah. industry. My question. take is better than all of yours. Yeah. <laughs> but is there anything about it, about RPG development, about the g gaming industry in general that, that makes your job really difficult or maybe that you'd like to change, but, but really I'm, I'm curious what, what about y th the industry itself makes your job really difficult? Like what, what the challenges? Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to say too much about, just because I think I, I'm very fortunate to have the job that I have and be able to do the work that I do, you know, course, any, there are always things that could make it easier, you know, having more personnel and being able to, uh, pay more to the freelancers. So if I had a huge pot of money, <laughs> That would make everything easy. <laughs> right, right. So that's um, the frustrating thing is that you're not, um, <laughs> it is that you're not incredibly rich. Uh. <laughs> right, right. So, so let's do something about that. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, but that, that's you know that that's an obvious answer to to anything with, with any job you can think about. You know, well, if I just had five more assistants and much more cool equipment, this would be so much easier. Um. So that, that, you know, that, that's, it's not a big deal. Um, I think, I, I guess if I looked at anything, it would be being able to keep up with all the channels of input that are available out there. Um, because the, the fan base is great and excited and passionate about Shadowrun. Um, so we have forums going on about Shadowrun and the mm -hmm. Shadowrun Facebook mm -hmm. page. And then another Shadowrun Facebook page, the Shadowrun Union, and there are podcasts, and there's the Reddit page, and there's all sorts of places where people are talking about Shadowrun in different ways. And I can't keep up with it all, just because there's too much of it, and you know my my time is not there's not a huge amount of extra time to do that. Um, so. If there was an easier way for me to harness all of the ideas that are coming up and all of the thoughts and input and interface with all the people there, uh, that would be nice because mm -hmm. I, I just don't have time to spend with people and to answer all the questions and to talk about some concerns. Um, but being able to do that more or having help to do that more would not be a bad thing. So it, it is sometimes challenging that I can't that I know things, are, discussions are out there happening, and I can't be involved in them just because there's there's too much going on. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of people would agree with that. I know uh, one of the when we do start the after party in, in a second, one of the first things I was going to ask you about 
that I had a question from somebody was um, has to do with communication. So so it doesn't surprise me that 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 would be a big part of um, something that you wish was easier and, and would make yeah. everything um, easier for you. Uh, so um, we, go ahead, Cassie. Can we end on a high note and find out what's coming out soon? Yes, absolutely. Good, <laughs> good idea. I've heard, I've heard you mentioned uh, what's coming out a little bit in 2018 at uh, Gen Con. I think you did an interview there. Uh, yeah, let's see. What, what's on? You're way ahead of me. What's coming out 2018? <laughs> uh, is that the Elfin uh, Dwarf book I have at Gen Con? I also have the Advanced Matrix book coming out in this earlier summer of 2018. Which has got um, techno stuff in it, I think. That was uh... that, yes. I will have the techno. The stuff that was going to be in the separate techno master ebook will be in that book. There, guys. Everyone who's been complaining in the chat room the whole time that I haven't asked the techno the technomancer question yet. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what a surprise that that came up. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's that's for for many reasons. If people want, especially in the after party, if we want to go into all the reasons that that is what it is. That's where it is, and that's what we're doing with it. Um, but the very next book that will be coming out is a book called Dark Terrors. Uh, so we're going to have more insect stuff. We're going to update what the Shadim have been up to lately. There have been a lot of seeds planted about the Black Lodge and what they're going on about, so we'll have a whole Black Lodge chapter. Um, there was in Forbidden Arcana a tradition... Uh, an elder god tradition introduced. So we want to talk more about the people doing that tradition and what's going on. So that book will be coming out. We'll be looking at electronic release. Uh, and, and again, this is me committing to a time, but oh well. Uh, probably <laughs> early November. And then you'll see it hit stores after that. And then the book after that. Um, was originally going to be the next book out of the gate, but for art reasons, we had to switch things around, is our advanced combat book, Street Lethal. Yeah, I was just about to so, ask about that, because you had told me that that, that should already be out. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was going to be the next one out of Gen Con, yeah. but our very best gun illustration guy yeah. uh, got booked up. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, <laughs> and we I see. Use him, and then the way it was going to fall, it turned out better if we switched that with Dark Terrors. Right. So Street Legal is almost done. The writing is all done, and, and most of it's laid out, even. Uh, so lots of weapons, information on corporate security, information on unconventional fighting forces like pirates and fun stuff like that. And oh, that's some awesome. Good yeah. Pirate. I didn't know pirates were coming. <laughs> that's really cool. Uh, and then since you guys know Opti, you might know that one uh, brand of shadow running that he's particularly passionate about is hooding. Those shadow runners who are trying no, to. I had no idea. <laughs> yes. He hides it well. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a whole hooding source book uh, coming out called wow. Better Than Bad. And so that is being worked on right now by the writers. And along cool. with information on hooding and notable hooders of the sixth world, we'll also take a look at Pretoria because we haven't had a good African continent city write up in a long time. So we'll yes. get a lot of detail about Pretoria. Awesome. Better than bad. I like that. The title for that. That's a cool title. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, here, uh, let's do this. Yeah, that music means that we are uh, here at the end of the show. Uh, but those of you listening live, never fear. We're going to be hanging out a little bit longer in the after party. We're going to ask some questions and, and just ch chat uh, and talk and, uh, and, and stuff. Um, if you're a patron of the Sixth World Podcast, you do get access to that if you weren't able to be here live. So um, you, you get the extended episodes on our Patreon page. So consider doing that if you want to. Go to patreon.com slash Sixth World Podcast. It helps us out. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming on and talking to us, Jason. My pleasure. Happy that I could be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Very, very cool, interesting discussion. I've, uh, I, um... I, I sometimes wonder if I would ever want to uh, get into, you know, developing RPGs and everything. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it was, it was, it was an enlightening uh, conversation to have for that reason. Cassie, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, no, I'm, I'm excited about all this stuff. And I think it was a good context to get an idea of 
<laughs> Jason is our one and only catalyst person. No, yeah. <laughs> there's other people involved in the process. Right. Appreciate all you do, man. <laughs> Wonderful yeah. freelancers who make it happen, so they're awesome. Yeah, we definitely love them. Absolutely. <laughs> um, is there anything uh, we always give our guests? A lot of the people we have on are, are writers and podcasters and media creators and everything. So we always like to give people the opportunity to plug something if they have anything to plug. Do you have anything that you'd like to do that for before we go? I got all the shadow and stuff coming out. Yeah. Oh, but, oh, but one thing. Um, I had a, a book under shadows, shadow book that I wrote a while ago, and we kind of released it and then we've had trouble getting things in barnes and noble but it should be in barnes and noble and bookstores all over Ooh, next month cool so if you haven't read it and then we also should finally get the electronic release going so under shadow is that what you said under shadows plural yeah awesome yeah check that book out um especially our our we've always got people asking where to get shadowrun shadowrun books and in and novels and stuff so check it out Mm -hmm. um, Cassie, you got anything to plug before you go? Anything going on on the Emerald Grid? Yeah, check out the Emerald Grid Twitch channel on Sunday. I think it's at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. We're going to get you old Funky Town, aka okay, Bobby here, back in the See, That's right. He's only been on probation for a year, guys. He's not completed <laughs> 10 games in yeah. over a year. Yeah. It's, uh, you know. Get him back on. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a busy guy. I'm not going to make excuses, though. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. It is at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, so that's going to be fun. And, uh, yeah. Uh, next episode that we're doing, I might not have even finally confirmed this with Cassie, so she might be hearing this for the first time, is <laughs> going to be, next episode of the <laughs> podcast is going to be on, on, we mentioned it tonight, The Complete Trog. We're going to have Scott Schletz back to talk about it with us. So uh, we're excited about that. And uh, yeah, so um, if you want to contact us on the show, you can tweet us at the number six world podcast you can email us at the show at sixworldpodcast.com our website is sixworldpodcast.com our outro music which you're about to hear is done by johnny nuclear in the meltdowns logo artwork that we have is done by david mcdermott you can find him at sixworlddesigns.tumblr.com he's amazing at what he does and he's such a nice person so uh check him out uh from me from uh, from me, Cassie, and Jason here. Bye bye. Say goodbye. Bye. bye. Hello. <laughs> uh, let me. Uh, oh, I almost made it. Here we go. But I'm not going to. Let's end that and do that. When the days have gone dark and the sky's turning gray, everybody in the world they're just staying a slave. The technology's machines. We just feast for the screen. Lost in reality. I'm piecing your dreams Society sodomized by the lies and the greed Addicted to the tech corpse Keeping us weak We wheel and deal for them and now we're waging the wars But because we're brainwashed We keep begging Back Alright, let's uh Stop and start the stream Yay! I heard a I heard a little a little kid um, Earlier yeah, she was trying to be good staying away, but now she's here for the after party for at least a second. Yay! Mm -hmm. I love kids. What's her name? This is Ace Lynn. Ooh, how old? Four.